Hi, and welcome to Voices in the Wilderness, a show on science and faith that addresses questions posed by skeptics, Christians, and non-Christians, ones struggling to reconcile uh, science with their Christian faith, and those deconstructing and reconstructing as well. We bring in various voices and conversations to open paths for those who wander to connect with Jesus along their journey. Uh, if you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, you may ask questions in the chat box and we will try to get to them if we have the, the time. Thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to just introduce our guest. We have Dr. Oscar Gonzalez. Um, and I'll tell you his bio in just a moment, but we want to make sure everything's working on Facebook and YouTube first. And um, So in the meantime, uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Gonzalez. Why don't you tell us about your favorite bird? <laughs> Hello, Christine. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here in this show. And uh, well, my favorite bird is uh, the golden bucket mountain tanager. Uh, what's that? <laughs> That's a bird that you are only going to see if you come to the mountain forest of Peru. And that is, uh, is a big bird. It's like a big warbler. It's colorful, yellow. Uh, black and green and it is endemic that means that you are only going to find it there and it's also threatened so when i was doing my research on avian ecology in the mountain forest of peru i was able to see it and it is amazing that's why i love it <laughs> yeah we have a a lot of eagles in my area and there are eagle cams watching the chicks being hatched and They've already had mm -hmm. a few chick hatches, which is amazing to me because today it's not even uh, it's not even above freezing, and they have these little chicks in the snow that are hatching. Um, very different environment than tropical. So, oh. But Peru has mountains. You guys have cold and oh, yes. all kinds of all kinds of climate. Of course. Uh, we, well, we, where I am uh, right now is Lima, and um, Lima it is in the coast uh, we have uh, the beach um, baited by the pacific ocean there are a lot of uh, wetlands but really it is uh, it's very dry it's a desert but then the high andes uh, the top of the high andes mountains we have glaciers so very cold places there around and in the other side of the mountains uh, in the border with uh, brazil and other countries we have the amazon forest that is quite also quite different if you are and um, uh, the foothills or uh, close to the mountains or in the lowlands. Uh, so, oh, there's uh, all kinds of environments. If you like birds, if you like nature, please uh, uh, contact me. Maybe we can go bird into here. <laughs> well, doctor, uh, we, we've been excited to get you on the show. I just wanted to say to the viewers, um, just before Christine, introduces you properly and we start our interview we are both live on facebook and youtube if you'd like to add a comment or a question we will try and get you in uh during the show um and um feel free to uh pose a question to the good doctor or a comment to any one of us um christine sure okay well today we have dr oscar gonzalez who's a biologist born and raised in peru he earned his phd in interdisciplinary ecology a master's in zoology, a master's in tropical biodiversity management, and a bachelor's in biology. Performed postdoctoral research on hummingbird ecology and is now extending his doctoral research on, oh goodness, nectarivorous birds in Peru's Andes Mountains communities with a focus on pollinator flower networks and climate change indicators. His he investigates topics on tropical ornithology, plant animal interactions, conservation, and the positive interaction between science and the Christian faith. He has several publications in English and Spanish about bird ecology and Christianity and science. Currently, he serves as vice president of Grupo Aves del Peru and teaches biology courses at two private universities in Lima, Peru. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, both of you, Joe and Christine, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Well, why don't you start, just tell us a little bit about your background, both academic and spiritual. Well, 
Uh, I'll start uh, with my academic background. Um, I uh, have been all the time a, a curious child. I really love nature since I was very, very young. I really prefer to uh, look for uh, books and nature documentaries uh, instead of uh, going out and playing soccer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my childhood friends uh, could testify <laughs> about that. And um, I have been curious all the time on nature. That's why I really uh, wanted to study biology after I uh, got into uh, high school. Uh, after high school, yeah. So um, then in, uh, in the university, uh, I started to develop a love for birds, ecology in special. Then I was able to work in education and doing research. Uh, later, I was able to do a master's, uh, two uh, master's in science, one in, in Lima. Uh, well, I, I also studied my undergrad in Lima, um, and my master's was in zoology, and then I got a grant to study um, tropical biodiversity management in Spain. And uh, later, um, I was able to uh, finish a PhD at the University of Florida in uh, interdisciplinary ecology. Um, after that, I uh, worked at the uh, Emmanuel College, a small Pentecostal college in Northeast Georgia. Uh, all that time, I have been involved in doing research and uh, conservation, mainly with uh, birds in Peru. So right after I um, finished my um, uh, my bachelor uh, with a group of uh, 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 students of biology, we formed the Grupo Aves del Peru, that means a group of study for the birds of Peru. And we have been very active in uh, doing research and conservation all, all over the country. And on my spiritual background, I was raised a Roman Catholic, um, but uh, I was not really Christian. Um, my little faith was easily destroyed uh, by uh, my science uh, teacher uh, when I started, uh, I think, 11th grade. Um, in one science class, uh, he was supposed to teach us about uh, matter, but instead of that, I remember he talked us about materialism. I don't really remember uh, what were the specific things that he said, but what I really remember was that after that class, I said to myself, God doesn't exist. So, and I was 11 years old, and until I was 15 years old, I, I considered myself an atheist, but later I started a spiritual cast, and then um, a classmate uh, told me about uh, uh, Jesus, that I needed to uh, make a special commitment to him and to recognize myself as, uh, as a sinner, so I needed uh, repentance, I needed a savior. And then I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior and uh, became a member of the Christian Missionary Alliance, that's the denomination that I'm still part of here in Peru. Uh, however, in, because I am a field biologist, I have been all over uh, Peru and also in, in other countries and in the US, I have been uh, quite happy attending uh, any sort of uh, pro Protestant church, like. Pentecostal, Presbyterians, anywhere where <laughs> the Lord is being proclaimed. And I, I'm happy that uh, I can um, I, I can say that I'm a scientist, but I'm also a committed Christian. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so what, what's your research focused on right now? <clears throat> um, I am doing research on plant-animal interactions. That is uh, the meat of ecology. <laughs> um, ecology is the study of interactions. So, well, uh, we, we can name plants, we can name birds, but uh, how 
do they interact with each other? That is the main question that I, um, I'm trying to solve. And uh, we have in several places a uh, ch uh, checklist of birds, checklist of plants, but no idea uh, what will happen if one uh, is not there, how the other is going to be affected, how these uh, animals depend on that plants and vice versa. So for my doctoral dissertation, I um, studied those interactions of a specific group of birds that are the birds that feed on nectar. What are those? Hummingbirds. <laughs> but not just the hummingbirds. There are some other birds that are not very well known um, that also uh, feed on nectar and are not uh, hummingbirds, the flower piercers. These birds all, also are part of a big chain, a food web that depend on the plants that produce nectar. So I have been studying that in the mountain forest of, of Peru and uh, in my postdoctoral research uh, with uh, birds and plants in the dry forest of Mexico. Um, that is what uh, it is. Uh, that is the, the main research that I'm doing right now. I'm analyzing a lot of data that, that I have for um, no, the, the research that we have been doing for several years. So, okay, you talked about ecology being the study of how plants and, and animals interact. Um, what do you call it when you study the interaction of science and faith? And how, do, how, do you, how does your science and faith overlap and interact in your work and in your personal life? <laughs> Well, uh, here I can say that it, it is possible to see a sort of evolution <laughs> because it has not been the same. That relationship between my um, my faith and the science that I have been doing. Um, the same uh, person that uh, shared the gospel with me, <clears throat> that uh, person told me that I shouldn't trust what the science teacher says because uh, it is against the word of God. Uh, because uh, the word of God says that uh, the, um, the, ear, the earth was created in six days, that uh, every uh, plant, every animal has been created according to their kind, so evolution is impossible. And uh, do you that I remember that uh, professor, that science professor that uh, convinced me that there was no God, but then later by myself I said, no, there should be a God. And then uh, <clears throat> this uh, friend that told me all this, um, uh, all the beauty of the gospel, but then it is conflated with that vision that uh, science is against faith, then that interaction was conflict. So I, I said to myself, well, then, the science that they are telling us is in conflict with faith. However, they told me, look, that is not the real science. The real science is uh, the science that this guy, this guy, this guy are, are telling the uh, creation scientists hmm, mm -hmm. that were very popular in the 80s and the 90s. So I said, well, those are the ones that are really scientists because they are uh, Christian scientists. However, um, when I tried to um, convince uh, some friends that knew more science than me about <laughs> this creation science, all my arguments were destroyed. And then I had my first faith crisis when I was 17 or 18, I think. And uh, it really was a very bad time for me. I remember feeling terrible uh, because it is like I feel I'm deceived. Uh, well, if uh, this doctrine about uh, Genesis and, <clears throat> and creation is wrong, then maybe all the gospel thing is wrong. And uh, well, that was my time in the wilderness. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank God that. Uh, well, I try to focus not not in this area of my life, but also in the communion with the Lord. But uh, due to that, I, I could not avoid 
the topic of uh, origins and evolution. Uh, that was a conflict all the time there. But then I found out the American scientific affiliation. Uh, thank God that I, at that time, I could uh, understand English. And uh, um, I started to read all the, uh, the articles that were available at that time. And uh, it was so refreshing for me to find out that it is possible that there, there's no conflict, really. There could be harmony between science and faith. In, but not in a way of conflating it, not in a way that one trumps the other, not that way. You can accept what mainstream science says and also accept the Bible as the Word of God. So I thought, well, it's not that really these scientists are saying falsehoods, that there is a conspiracy against faith. It is maybe I am interpreting the Bible in the wrong way. The Bible is not a science textbook. <laughs> that I was wrong all this time. And it's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit that I should uh, learn uh, science through the Bible. It is the, the purpose is to get me closer to the Lord. Science is incidental. Science is a tool. So from this conflict that started when I became a Christian, it uh, changed both to uh, communication and harmony. I'm very thankful for that because so many people have their faith shipwrecked when they um, discover what they have been taught with regard to creation science, that it doesn't line up with the evidence and the reality of the world around us. Um, so we're so thankful for, for your testimony and hope that your voice can be an encouragement to those who are struggling with those ideas too. Um, so now you're even involved in a number of organizations and forums discussing science and faith, right? So um, tell us a little bit about a couple of the organiz organizations that you are a part of and where people could find resources if they have the same kind of questions or are wrestling through issues like you did. Well, the, f the first one that I um, <clears throat> uh, do recommend for um, anybody who is in the United States or is an English speaker is the American Scientific Affiliation to um, publish this wonderful uh, journal, Perspective of sci on Science and Christian Faith. As, uh, you can, I don't know if it's possible to see, but this is one of the first numbers that I got. I think this is in 1997 <laughs> when I was a student member. Uh, of course, now you can um, look for it in the in the web. At that time, um, that was through just normal uh, mail <laughs> by uh, newsletters that came by snail mail to my house. I have to pay a lot of money to <laughs> to just uh, have it there. Now, that is uh, one uh, one resource you know, that uh, you can get. And uh, another organization that, uh, well, now I'm a, I'm a member, not a student member, a member of the uh, American Scientific Affiliation. Another organization that I do recommend is BioLogos, uh, who was the f founded by uh, Dr. Francis Collins. Mm -hmm. Dr. Francis Collins, as uh, most of you know, uh, he uh, published this wonderful book, The Language of God. You should get it huh? because uh, here is how a little si scientist um, could uh, became a Christian in his uh, older ages and how he could find this reconciliation between faith and uh, his science. And uh, well, I'm happy to be uh, part of the ad advisory board of Biologos. Uh, we are um, helping to translate some of the key materials for teaching in Spanish. And for the Spanish-speaking friends, um, please uh, hold on, <laughs> because uh, maybe at, uh, in some months, the Biologos website is uh, going to be have a lot of resources in Spanish. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, that's great. I um, have some friends in Honduras, and they're always looking for Spanish resources, too. So I'm happy to hear that. Um, 
Doctor, I, I want to dig in a little bit just on on your path. And you said uh, your crisis of faith, really, when when you were introduced to young earth creationism and for a while it sounds like you you thought that that was the proper interpretation of say early genesis and so forth until you wandered on some articles from asa and other areas that introduced you to christians who accepted modern science and and still were devout followers of christ uh, there are many people who walk the same path that that you walked and um presented with the same information um the, the book the language of god or other articles uh, presented with christian uh people who happen to be scientists who say that uh, evolution is not an enemy that it's you know accepted well accepted by most biologists practicing in the world today and yet they they don't come to the same conclusion you do they double down because in the back of their minds, they have it that it's either the Bible or modern science, and it can't be both. They've been taught this by their youth leaders, possibly by their parents, by pastors, by their favorite apologists online. Why do you think it was um, different for you? Um, you seem to uh, have more of a trust towards science, but in that environment that we're talking about, that young earth environment, you almost have to adopt a conspiracy-like theory towards scientists where you think that they're actually lying, that they're openly, that they know better and they're lying. This is kind of the line we're taught by many of the apologists. What, what, what was different for you in that journey? that might be uh, for, for some others who might be listening today? Um, well, uh, what was a bit more uh, different was that uh, I had to study science in detail because that was my purpose and my mission to be a scientist. It's not just about hearing a scientist. Um, I had as a purpose to, be, to become a scientist. And uh, for those who uh, are still as skeptical of uh, um, modern science. I can say that I understand. I understand uh, uh, why they are like that. Because uh, as in my case, the at the beginning, um, all the uh, esteemed uh, realities of the gospel that Jesus uh, loves you, he dies for you, and uh, you have to repent, then that is tied to uh, the literal interpretation of of Genesis, and if you just take out uh, a thread of that, everything collapses. Mm. Of course, uh, the first uh, reaction will be uh, defensive. And also, something like that is that um, I, my first, uh, my youngest encounter with uh, somebody who resembled a scientist was this teacher in high school that. Uh, convinced me that there was no God <laughs> and uh, for some of these uh, pastors or youth leaders that uh, are telling are saying don't trust this sort of scientists uh, don't believe on, uh, uh, that uh, the, the flood was not global or that evolution is real maybe it is because they have been exposed to only this sort of scientists that they are openly atheist and we know so many that uh, they have their um, um, their TV programs, their websites, they're tweeting a lot. That uh, they are so popular. So maybe they this sort of exposure. Uh, that is the idea, the stereotype of a scientist that uh, a scientist doesn't believe in God. Well, the difference for me was that uh, I could see and I could meet scientists that were really Christians and that they just said mainstream mainstream science and uh, that that was something that really a lot a sense of trust uh, that I could uh, uh, that I could see that uh, these scientists are not the enemy they are not in a conspiracy to destroy my faith uh, they are just exploring nature in the same way that I'm doing and they found out that the conclusions lead them to find out that uh, common descent is the most probably uh, theory that explains everything that uh, 
it's not possible that uh, every all the air was covered by water in one time and also something else is the different way how to interpret the bible yes we have to read the bible but we have to learn how to interpret it and if we are just uh, hearing one side one way of interpreting the bible well uh, uh, a literal view of the bible is not correct who some of you have not seen and and I'm um, taking out uh, his eye or her eye <laughs> or chopping her her hand after using of course there are portions of the bible that are not to be taken literal so let's let's uh, review our concepts on what is science and what is yeah. a proper bible interpretation so doctor you arrived at a, kind of a comfortable place where you realized that that uh, your understanding of the faith and mainstream science weren't necessarily in conflict at all. But there are some that would say that they might not be in conflict, but they might not complement one another. In other words, the Bible and evolutionary theory. So um, in a previous interview, you, you, you said this, you said, now in my research on bird ecology, I love to see the benevolence of the creator, how he has created this true evolutionary process and all the ecological interactions. Then I try to tell the many people around me that the main point of having all this creation around us is f for us to care for it. I love that statement. However, um, for the sake of those watching who are on the other side, who aren't young earth creationists or, or who might have transitioned away from the faith because of the same obstacles you were helped to overcome, uh, by some of those voices in the wilderness. Um, I want to share a, a, a famous quote from uh, Charles Darwin, who talks about the parasitic wasps that embed themselves in caterpillars. And he says, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the what what is now called the Darwin. I won't even try and attempt to do that there. It's called the Darwin wasp. Uh, with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. So my question to you here is this. If you had the opportunity to talk to Charles Darwin or somebody who, who thought in, along those lines, you look at ecology, you look at the relationship between the hummingbird and, and other things, and you see the wonder of God and his benevolence. And Darwin looks at the parasitic wasp and 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 doesn't see a God of benevolence. How would you talk to him about your view? How, how would you persuade somebody who has Darwin's view that no, God is benevolent and his creation is, even though it might not be uh, to our standards? Yeah, I, I got it because uh, um, yeah, sometimes uh, the, the perfect uh, uh, sort of benevolence in nature, you may see um, a hummingbird uh, feeding in a flower but uh, something curious that I can tell you when I was uh, um, chasing hummingbirds and, and checking what flowers do they interact with I found out that some of them are cheaters <laughs> some of them are use holes in the in the flowers and they don't pollinate the flowers they crop the flowers and uh, in uh, in some cases, uh, these other birds that are with the hummingbirds there in the high uh, in the high Andes, they are experts in robbing the flowers. Their name are the flower piercers. Why they have their name? Because they have a specific uh, bill that is adapted with a hook. Is very useful to pierce a flower and rob the flower and not doing pollination <laughs> so this is a situation that uh, one one can say well what happened here this is not uh, perfect is it uh, maybe we can blame adam for that <laughs> however something that i can see is that something good can get out of it uh, also in this uh, complex ecological interaction that i found out with the hummingbirds, flower verses and flowers. Um, there are some sort of uh, hummingbirds and one in special that is an endemic one 
is the coppery metal tail. This is an endemic hummingbird that is possible to be found there. However, this bird is not endangered. It is in good numbers. Uh, it is possible to be found out as quite common. But how is possible that? Because that bird can feed in um, flowers that it will never be able to reach if it will, will not be by the holes in those large flowers that the hummingbirds are making. So it is like uh, Joseph said to his brothers something maybe that you intended for evil at the end it was for good. <laughs> no? And uh, yeah, uh, looking at uh, how the the caterpillar explodes with all these uh, um, uh, larva wasps could be horrendous, <laughs> could be so gore and gory. But that is a good way to control populations. And that is a specific sort of uh, methodology that has been there for way before us. And of course, maybe we will not like to be in the same place as the caterpillar, of course. <laughs> but uh, it is possible to see this sort of order in nature that uh, if we go with our anthropocentric eyes, we'll say, well, that's bad, that's wrong. And the easiest way will be, as I have I talked to some friends, well, Adam has the fault. He should not have eaten the fruit. That is why this poor caterpillar is uh, dying because of the wasp. That's why the, uh, the hummingbird and the flower pressure behave like that. Sorry, I don't think so. <laughs> I think that nature is good. Nature is God's creation. I can see um, in ecological interactions a purpose uh, that is to glorify God. It's not just to amuse us. Hmm? Yeah, that's really good. I want to follow up on a little something that you said earlier with your friend who uh, introduced the gospel, but then he tied it into... Um, a denial of science. Um, and we see that too often, right? Pastors, apologists, youth leaders are teaching that people who accept mainstream science aren't really Christians. Um, but doesn't this mean that salvation um, by grace through faith in Jesus isn't sufficient? Isn't that the message when you say that you have to have some kind of belief about biology or the age of the earth or Noah's flood and, and attach that to the gospel. What's the danger here? It's really dangerous <laughs> because uh, if uh, we're going to tie all all the, those doctrines, those uh, that came from younger creationism, then uh, uh, later when we are going to find out all these errors, we may conclude that uh, even the salvation uh, by grace only to Christ has the same value that uh, the canopy theory or uh, any other sort of beliefs that younger creationists want us to believe that are not even backed up by, by the Bible. <laughs> so, uh, no, let's focus on the main point of what uh, um, the message of uh, Genesis tells us, that there is a creator that uh, uh, God created everything for his glory. And we are uh, here as his stewards of all this uh, wonderful creation. It is uh, not the purpose, as I said earlier, of the Holy Spirit to teach us science. It is to uh, get us in a special relationship with him. If we are going to uh, try to see uh, the book of Genesis like a science chronicle, or even other parts of the Bible, we are, maybe are going to conclude that the Bible is false, and then I will just trash it. Uh, so we, we have to uh, have a good way of how to interpret the, the Bible, and also check science and not see science as something that is against the Bible. It's not a good idea now to try to complement in that way, science and the Bible trying to try to fix more well. Those are uh, th th this is the 
uh, these days are maybe millions of years and try to try to force uh, things that uh, the author of Genesis never intended to be to, uh, to say yeah. things. you know uh, to continue with uh, Christine's line of thinking oftentimes we'll hear those same Christians that she mentioned say ask you do you believe in evolution or they'll um, they'll say well I don't believe in evolution or something like that and you have this quote previously where you say, I would say, I do not believe in evolution because as a scientist, I cannot have beliefs. I accept a scientific theory or I reject a scientific theory. So as a scientist, I accept evolutionary theory because it works and I can see that evolution does not deny the word of God. My question to you on this, Doctor, is maybe you can give a couple examples of how evolution works, number one. But when you run across somebody who says to you that they don't believe in evolution and they kind of conflate the idea of, I don't know, a philosophy or a theology with with actual a science that can be that can be tested and with predictions and, and so forth in the laboratory. Do you, how, how do you try and explain the difference uh, between a belief and, and the fact that you accept scientific theory? And maybe give us a couple examples of what you'd point out to a layman, somebody you know who's not a scientist, to give them confidence that evolutionary theory actually, actually does work. Um, well, what I... Um... The, the stuff that I do in my first day of classes uh, when I teach um, uh, principles of biology too at, uh, <laughs> at Emmanuel College. Um, my students have been, um, um, they, they came from um, usually homeschool, uh, our homeschool in Northeast Georgia. So we have the majority are uh, evangelicals and they most of them they have this background so I start by telling them let's be clear on this in this class you're going to hear a lot of all earth and evolution um, wh what effect this words uh, have on you does it make you feel uncomfortable maybe because you have been told by uh, either your parents or your pastors that uh, th th that um, concept is wrong, that is against the Bible. Well, I have been in your shoes. I know what it feels. But uh, let's define evolution. Let's put it clear on this. If you're going to ask me if I do believe in evolution, I'll tell you, no, I don't. It is not that I put my faith in evolution. I don't pray to Darwin. <laughs> I read the Bible uh, and I extract quotes of the Bible and give thanks to to the Lord. I I read the origin of the species and uh, stuff like that, but I I don't uh, make a devotional based on that. <laughs> so uh, it is not the same to put your faith to trust entirely in something that to accept a scientific theory. It is like you are using a tool and you see that it works in this way. So if maybe another tool comes, it could replace it. And uh, later, uh, no, sorry, a uh, long time ago, uh, it worked to uh, have the geocentric theory, uh, having this, uh, the earth at the center and everything uh, um, was around the earth. That was a scientific theory, but it was wrong. So. There was the heliocentric theory that replaced it, and now we are accepting that theory. No, nobody knew how uh, how to explain the orbits of the planets. We have uh, universal gravitation; is a theory that works. It is not that we are putting our faith in that. Mm -hmm. No, it's not the same. Our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that is our Savior. And the scientific theory is to be accepted or rejected. And uh, it, it says nothing about uh, the existence of God. Uh, science are, is silent on, in terms of uh, faith or God. 
uh, the fact that some scientists are outspoken atheists, that is maybe what confuses people. Because uh, that uh, that is what may cause them, well, but this guy and this guy who is a scientist has said this against God, this against the Bible. Uh, well, uh, that's his or her opinion. No? Because uh, the main mainstream science of evolution and geology is not saying anything against our faith. So sometimes I've heard Christians express skepticism about evolution and they maybe think that evolution is mindless and random and unguided. Um, is evolution those things and is that a problem for Christianity? Well, uh, it's a process and uh, it's a process, uh, but uh, we don't know that uh, God is in control of everything. Uh, the Bible says that uh, no hair of your uh, of your head falls down if he doesn't allow that, or also no bird falls down if uh, if uh, God doesn't allow that. So um, for us, it may seem randomless, purposeless, with no objective in mind. However, we we do we can see that uh, there is a sort of progression. And uh, that uh, view that uh, um, even uh, evolution as a process is a total uh, random process that could produce anything, that is the view of some of the evolutionists, like uh, the latest Stephen Jay Gould. But uh, we have, for example, uh, Simon Conway Morris, uh, that is uh, an excellent researcher in evolution, and he is also a Christian, that he uh, says that evolution is going to produce all the time something is directed so but the purpose the way that how and it, it is going yeah it uh, plays with all the possibilities but in the end uh, it it is going to deliver something and god already knows god knows everything god is even the god of uh, chance and randomness so Maybe when uh, Joseph was uh, sold by his brothers uh, and when he was in the jail, uh, he may have think, what is the purpose? What is the point? It's, it's spurious everything on that. But then later he could find out. <laughs> and uh, I'm not saying that uh, this part of the book of Genesis is related to evolution or anything like that. I'm, I'm just saying, I am making an analogy there. No? that uh, something that we may think well, all this is, has no purpose at all it has a purpose we may not see it yet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. doctor you use the term creation care and you said part of what you do in the integration of faith and science is you you try and convince people or at least persuade them that the church is an important place. They have a, a great influence on, on Christians and that we should approach the church and talk to them about creation care as a motivating force or a motivating factor for Christians. Uh, one of the other places, it's gonna seem like I'm picking on my fellow Christians here in, in America, um, but not only is the Young Hearth thing kind of has, has has a strong foothold here in North America, but so does this kind of bias against climate change, um, where Christians here kind of think that's anti-Christian and that's also a made up thing to uh, more of a political uh, uh, option. So you famously, uh, uh, I think you agree with me on that. You, you famously said at one point, first of all, by the way, the denial and skepticism of climate change is something that is quite North American. In South America and tropical America, you don't need to convince people that there is climate change. They are living that. Maybe you can talk just for a second uh, about the difference between those two faith communities down there where it's accepted um, is there is there more of an understanding as the Christian as a steward of God's creation, and 
uh, how difficult is your approach when you are in North America and you you bump into Christians who think it's a hoax? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, well the difference is uh, geographical in terms that uh, um, uh, in places that are not the tropics, uh, you see that uh, the weather is quite different between uh, winter and summer. Winter is quite cold, <laughs> it is snowed and everything, and summer is terribly hot, isn't it? Well, in the tropics, the difference is not so big. It's mostly between uh, the, um, the time that rains and the time that it uh, doesn't rain. So those extremes, I think you that uh, live there in North, Amer North America, uh, Europe, uh, you have seen those sorts of extremes. So when somebody is going to tell you, hey, the weather is changing, you know, the climate is changing, so what? I do see that it changes all the time. The point is that you do not measure the, um, the climate in only one season. You need a lot of years to understand how the climate is and how it is behaving. And uh, in the tropics, um, and not just in Peru, but in other um, uh, countries, uh, and even in Africa and Asia, we can see that uh, the regular patterns uh, are getting terrible and crazy. And people are suffering. Why? Because the farmers are not getting um, the crops in time. The rains are not coming when they are supposed to come and then uh, there, is, there are drugs. There is no water available for the crops and the animals. So this stuff is uh, are going to impact livelihood, livelihoods of people and they're going to suffer and become more poor. In North America, uh, due to the affluence, so the there is a little bit more of heat or so, so maybe you're not going to feel it because, so, okay, no problem, you just turn uh, the AC a little bit uh, more and that's it. No? <laughs> um, uh, so it is a sort of a cultural thing and a geographical thing that uh, make these communities uh, so, sometimes so different on the people that uh, are know and see if the climate change my life changes and mm -hmm. I suffer you know just a quick follow-up to that and then I'm gonna um, pass the baton to Christine and that is you speak about the integration of science and faith but when it comes to this issue of climate change with at least Christians in America it almost seems like it's a political thing <laughs> and so when you find Christians that that are allowing their political view to trump their faith view, how, how is there a good way to approach that kind of uh, brother or sister, and 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 try and prioritize the fact that that God does make us stewards, and that that it that we need to be better caretakers of planet Earth. I do recommend follow, following the advices of Catherine Hayhoe. Uh, I fully endorse her and uh, getting her book, Saving Us, it will be a good way <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh, we should talk about this, but uh, not as the way uh, people are usually talking in the media, in uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or whatever social media they are using because uh, usually people just yell at each other and uh, if we are really Christians we are supposed to be known not by our political um, standards we are supposed to be known by love how do we show love to each other how do we love our neighbor so <clears throat> um, Let's start by saying, well, let's talk in something that we have in common. Something that we have to agree is that we have to love our neighbor. And our neighbors are suffering because the climate is changing. 
maybe not in the US or any, anywhere in Europe, but in South America, in Africa, and in other places, um, they are suffering a lot. And uh, that is because we, we do see, we can see evidence that there is change in the climate. And even our way of life is exacerbating that. Trash in the environment, overconsumption, it is uh, not caring for the land that the Lord has given us. We should read again Genesis 1 <clears throat> um, all the way when uh, God created man for what? Oh, to have dominion. Yes, but in which way? In a way that we have to keep until the earth, as Genesis 2.15 says, because we are the stewards. We should uh, emphasize that, that uh, a steward is not the owner. A steward is the person who is in charge of something that is not his or hers. And God is going to make us accountable. What are we doing with his land, his water, his animals, his forest, his wetlands? Those are theirs. They are not just us to um, uh, rubbish on all their natural resources. What is going the what is this, the future that we are going to give for the other generations, for the people that are going to be after we are here? We cannot just uh, give them, okay, just uh, pray and everything will be okay. Let's then read the book of James when it says, okay, if your brother has nothing to eat, what are you going to say? Yeah, okay, I'll pray for you and that's it. <laughs> no, I think we are, uh, this is not just about saving uh, trees, polar bears, or or uh, maybe uh, siding with a political party. It's about loving God and loving your neighbor and doing what the Bible is telling us to do, to be stewards. Yeah, that's really good. That's important. Um, how How is conservation related to climate change? It is highly related in this way. Well, with conservation, we mean uh, the application of creation care. In, if we want to have the um, nature uh, for us, all the properties of nature to be productive in the future, um, we need to keep this system where the plants and the animals are somehow in um, stability. That means that we know that this ecological community is going to be somehow in the same place, in the same conditions. But when uh, the climate is changing, what is going to happen and what is happening now is that the plants are going to produce flowers in a different time or fruits in a different time. The insects are going to um, um, are going to be present, are going to breed, in not in the time that they are, are specifically in this in the place where they in the time that they should be uh, uh, given birth. And the birds and other animals depend on that, depends on the plants and the insects. That means that some of these animals are going to move. They are not going to be there. They are going to go to other places. But these other places could be occupied, already occupied by other species. Then it could be competition. And that is something that uh, I have been studying in the um, tropical Andes. We, right in the place where I was doing my research, that was the top of the Amazon forest. Um, right in the border with the Puna Highlands. Uh, from the east, going from the east to the west, it is the lowland forest, that is uh, um, uh, areas similar to, uh, that are on mainland Brazil. Then this is the um, foothill forest, the mountain forest, and then there is uh, um, 
little uh, place where uh, small trees that are this known as the elfin forest because the uh, the forests are like shrubs and if you just keep going to the west you're going to find the Puna Highlands where uh, it is mostly pastures well if the temperature is rising that means that the, the animals that are adapted to uh, way to the top they are going to try to climb up and to move more to the top but these species that are there are going to have an encounter and immigration they're going to fight on them uh, anybody who knows some principles of ecology the principles of competitive exclusion that means that no species can occupy the same niche then mm. one of them could be extinct so maybe we're going to going to do our all our best to try to conserve an area but if the climate is going to change in that way there are going to be some processes of uh, immigration immigration that are going to make things quite worse because mm -hmm. some of the species are going to disappear anywhere hmm? Hmm. that's so sad yeah um, so what are some practical tips that we can do, um, say, as a family or in, a, in like a small community? Um, I mean, obviously we can vote too, but, but like just kind of practical tips that, that each of us can put into place to do a better job uh, of conservation and of being good stewards. And I mean, I think the first one I think of is not being wasteful. Um, trying to buy things in smaller package with less packaging and not wasting food or not wasting really well, anything um but what, what else can we do mm, i i'd recommend reading um calvin the wit um a pioneer in uh, the topic of creation care and i do remember his uh, advice that the first thing that we should do if we want to do something is to go out and contemplate. Let's go outdoors. Uh, we are so buried in our screens and uh, in all our electronic artifacts that uh, we have lost connection with nature. And that has been worse because of the pandemic. Hmm? So let's try to go out and check the plants, check the birds, do what uh, Jesus told us to do in Matthew 6. <laughs> look at the lilies of the field look at the birds of the air let's go out uh, with the family and try to observe this wonderful creation that god has entrusted us and then after having this contemplation and for the christians a moment of worship giving thanks god for all uh, the creation that he has done let's try to do specific activities to try to conserve the, this specific portion of creation that we can have close to us. Where is the natural area or protected area that is close to you? A state park, um, a national park maybe? If it is possible, let's uh, go out there and visit. And if there is a way to serve, to volunteer in, a, a, in an organization that uh, can help to care for the environment. It could be a Christian organization like uh, uh, Arosha or the Evangelical Environmental Network, or it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a Christian organization. It could be a secular organization where people are doing uh, research and conservation. I do belong to Grupo Aves del Peru, who is not a Christian organization, but uh, we are doing what Christians should be doing, <laughs> that is uh, caring for habitats and, and species. And of course, uh, starting by home, as you have said, Christine, let's not be wasteful, let's recycle. Let's take care of our trash in a way that is not going to impact others. Yeah, that's really important. Um, what do you think is the most, the most important message to share about cons conservation, about evolution, about science, and the the intersection of these science and faith topics? On the different sort of intersections, uh, we have to decide how this intersection is going to be. 
it is going to be with uh, conflict or harmony. If we are going to see our fate all the time with conflict, with mainstream science, with uh, uh, conservation, with uh, climate change, of all that, uh, we won't go anywhere. <laughs> we have to uh, <clears throat> try to build bridges with the uh, people that uh, are in those areas because uh, I think that nature matters to God because nature is creation and we are also creation. So when we conserve creation, we are also helping to uh, helping ourselves. On the topic of evolution, do not see it as uh, an evil ideology that is um, going to destroy your faith. It is just a scientific theory that it works for explaining how <clears throat> everything that is alive is in the way it is now. And uh, it uh, has nothing to do with uh, our, our faith. It shouldn't. If uh, somebody is telling you, um, it, you must believe this way, um, well, let's check and revise if uh, that is really what the Bible says. The Bible really says that, yes, the Lord is the creator, but that doesn't mean that uh, you have to deny mainstream science. God can do and create as he wants. Hmm? Let's uh, uh, not look for a conflict when there is no conflict there. God is the God of nature. He is going to be with us if we look for him. Yeah, so so uh, applying this forward, um, when we see it, like youth pastors and youth leaders and parents um, who who are really supposed to be our spiritual um, educators and guides and, and point us to the Bible, uh, what's your advice for for them for when they talk about science and faith with the st with students or um, with with the youth group or even with adults um, how, how would you advise them uh, so that that there aren't students that have the same type of faith crisis you had when you were younger well um, be, be sincere with uh, um, with your flock, <laughs> with uh, the people that is uh, under your care, that sometimes you will have to say, uh, when they ask you about the topic on science and faith, I don't know. Let's explore that together. Let's see what uh, available options are here. But whatever we're going to find, there is something that has to be clear. The Lord is the creator. And Jesus loves you no matter what. That is the main um, truth that is going to transcend anything that we're going to find out on, <clears throat> on science. And uh, I know that there are some views on the, uh, on the church that uh, it tell us the best way to interpret uh, the evidence is that the uh, earth is young or that the flood is global and, uh, and so on. Well, let's check also what uh, these other persons, theologians, and scientists that are Christians also say. But if you're going to say, no, this is the only way, this interpretation is the only way, um, you are causing a lot of damage. <laughs> because mm -hmm. if that uh, truth is um, going to find out that this view is wrong, maybe it's going to toss all those other teachings along with the view that he, I found out that is totally wrong. Uh, our faith in Jesus Christ does not depend on any uh, philosophy, human philosophy or Bible interpretation. It relies on Jesus only. Mm. Yeah, I love, I love that coming back to Jesus. Um, you know, well, we're, we're kind of up at an hour here, and this has been such an encouraging interview. I really appreciate your joining us today. Um, 
Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with our audience? Well, that, uh, please uh, keep uh, looking voices in the wilderness. <laughs> I had a chance to uh, watch at least uh, a couple of interviews and uh, it was really cool to find out uh, <clears throat> the path and the opinion of uh, Christians, other scientists, theologians, and mm -hmm. how they, they do see the um, uh, science and the Bible in a way that is highly respectful and uh, that uh, we can uh, start a conversation and uh, help to shape our faith. Um, it is, I don't think it's bad to deconstruct some traditions or interpretations that uh, may not fit with reality. Uh, we have, have the strong belief that is unmovable that Christ is the rock. Huh? Is mm -hmm. there? Us, that, that is where we are based, uh, we base our faith. But there are some other things that could be secondary that uh, we, we have to be open to inquiry. So looking voices in the wilderness. Uh, thank you for that, Doctor. It's a pleasure to get to know you and we look forward to having you on again and, and good luck in your work uh, in Peru and we hope to get you back in Georgia soon. Yeah. yeah well, 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 willing, we may uh, see each other in person. <laughs> okay. Take care, my friend. Great. Thank you for joining us. Right. Folks, thank, thank you so for much. listening. If you enjoyed the program, please share it with your friends or youth group uh, leaders, pastors, mom and dads. We'll see you next time. <laughs>